wicked world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God, my mic isn't even in. The mic is not in. I've started the show. I'm unprepared. Bear with me, people. Santoki is not here. You know already what's going on for Santoki. That means he's abroad somewhere, visiting some country somewhere. Let me put this mic in one second, people. Here we go. Let's start again. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, my name is Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, and welcome back to another edition, another conversation, a live show on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm one up, I'm one up today, no Santoki, but we've got to keep the show on the road. The, the West Indies tour of Australia is finally over. The multi-format tour is over. We drew the Test Series 1-1, we lost the ODI Series 3-0. And we just lost the T20 series 2-1. So the first thing everybody has to ask themselves, before I get into this analysis of the T20 series, the first thing everyone has to ask themselves is, prior to this Australia tour, knowing that we had a total of eight matches to play, would you have taken two wins across all formats? And I think the the most rational, logical, clear-headed West Indies fan would have said two wins from eight would be a positive return from an Australia multi-format tour. So no matter where you stand on the whole kind of, I'm not happy about this, I'm not happy about that, you definitely would have taken two wins from eight, particularly when you knew that one of those, if you knew that one of those wins was going to come in a test match. That one win in the test match almost is equivalent to three wins on tour in and of themselves. So I think first things first, we have to, you know what, round of applause. (laughs) Round of applause to our men, not the ODI ones, but round of applause to everybody else. Well done. Well done on your tour of Australia. We're going to champion you on your way back now to the Caribbean. Well done. You've done us proud. Two wins, two wins from eight. You know what? You can hold your head high. Well done, chaps. We salute you, you know? But um, this show, um, this show is to look at the the um, the T Twenty series, obviously, which we lost two one, and particularly looking at it in the context of uh, the fact that we've got uh, a home World Cup coming up in so wait a minute, February, March, April, May, a home World Cup which starts in four months. So everything about this context of this T Twenty two one series defeat has to be looked at in terms of what it means going forwards. And unlike most live shows where we just kind of riff from the top, take your comments and kind of go from there, you know, um, I actually wrote down some notes beforehand um, of of things that I want to discuss about this uh, T20 side. But just as a reminder of the results in the T20 series. So the first T20, um, Australia batted first and put 213 for seven on the board. And West Indies lost that one by 11 runs, posting 202 for eight in reply. In the second T20, Australia put 241 for four on the board. And West Indies lost that one by 34 runs, posting 207 for nine. And then today, or yesterday, depending on where you're listening to this from, uh, the West Indies batted first and posted 220 for six and restricted the Australians to 183 for five to win the final game by 37 runs. So I I don't know. And in fact, Jerry has already kind of said it. Yeah, it's a set of ridiculous scores still. Apart from today's one where Australia got, could only, were were restricted to 183, I think. When you have six T20 innings out of that three-match series and five out of the six innings are over 200, yeah, Jerry's right to say, it, it, generally speaking, it was flat pitches. And everybody can... <coughs> Sorry, people, I'm still a bit under the weather, you know. But um, everybody can 
um, everyone can talk about everyone's sorry, everyone's version of what makes an exciting T Twenty is different. Me personally, these matches where you get a score between anywhere between two hundred and ten and two hundred and forty, I'm not. I don't like those matches. I think it's too heavily weighted towards the batters. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's an argument about entertainment factor and how great it is to see pure sixes and pure fours and everything like that. But give me a 150 to 170 score where the match is intriguingly poised over anything over 200. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a fan of these just beat ball over the boundary games. This is, it, it, it just looks, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I need to think about it a bit more, but I don't call that entertainment personally. I don't, I don't see it as entertainment. I see it as too heavily weighted towards the batters. And it, I think even at the halfway stage, right, when West Indies made 220 in the game today, yesterday, whatever, Russell was interviewed at half time, and Russell was like, well, boy, we have to kind of just, you know, bowl tight lines and hope we can lull them into a mistake. So even, even Russell was kind of saying, well, boy, there's not really much in it for the bowlers here. You've got to kind of hope that a few batters play a few, um, uh, make a few on, um, enforced errors and give away their wicket. Like that, that to me isn't cricket. And that's why I think people are right to sometimes look at T20 and call it bat up and catch giggle cricket because two, 240 and 20 overs plays 220. Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's be serious now. Let's be serious. But anyways, that, 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 feels, that feels overly negative. That's just me and my personal take on what makes a good competitive T20 game. You can only play what you're playing um, and you can only try and win within the parameters of the game that you're playing. So if it means that you have to chase down 220, so be it. If it means you have to chase down 240, so be it. But anyways, let's get to the first talking point. And thank you to everybody who's in the live um, today. Um, let, let's let's get into it. Um, and actually, I think, who just made that point? Sorry, let me go back. Yeah, T. Brown's probably made the first point that I'm going to get at. So T. Brown has says, three innings, West Indies scored 200 plus, we're up. And that's actually my first point. So here we go. The first talking point I've got is, yeah, West Indies made 200 plus in three games. Um, people may think back to the tour of South Africa last year, around this time last year, where we again made significant scores over 200 um, against England in that series at Christmas. If I can find, did I bother to put the series results up for that game? Um, if I remember rightly with that England tour, I think there were two or two games at least on that England tour where we made significant scores over 200 as well. So I think it's weird because ultimately and fundamentally, you've got to look at a game in the context of wins versus losses. And how much do you put emphasis on, yeah, we made over 203 games. It shows that the batting is going on good. I hear all that. But you still have to place it in the context of win, wins versus losses. So I'm I'm reluctant to fall into the trap of saying, yeah, well, it our batting is strong. Um, and hmm, let me start again. I'm reluctant to fall into the trap of saying our batting is strong. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge that being able to consistently post over 200 does, to an extent, show that we are a force to be reckoned with with the bat. And I think significantly there was, certainly in two of those games, it looked like we weren't going to be able to post over 200 and we still had significant bat in depth going all the way down to probably Holder at eight or nine who could smash the ball over the boundary or to the boundary rope to help us score some big runs. And obviously T. Brown has said, well, yeah, the batting might be strong, but the bowling is weak. We're going to get to that. But there is, there is significant um, mileage in saying that this tour showed that we have the West Indian DNA back in terms of our batting depth and power. And I think it's been a long time since we had that. Whether people want to, pe people continue to talk about running hard twos and running ones. I think Sammy has very much brought this team back to the traditional West Indian metric of, you don't need to run ones and twos hard if you have 
the firepower to consistently hit the ball over the boundary rope or to the boundary. Um, and I think we've probably gone back a bit to that 2016, 2012, uh, 2014 mindset of we will overpower you. Obviously, though, T20 cricket has advanced and actually a lot of top level international sides have batters like a Glenn Maxwell or a, a Tim David who can power the ball over the boundary rope just as much as our players can. But the point is we've gone back to the DNA that suits our type of cricketers. And I, I ain't mad at that. I, I can't be mad at that. Let's move on. Second talking point. This is a big one. This is a big one. And it probably, this talking point probably feeds into at least another two talking points I've got. So I'll see if it all kind of marries up. By the way, people, like the live, share the live, subscribe to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, all of that, all of that. Put in your WhatsApp chats, put in your Facebook groups if there's any uncles and aunties here. Um, put it on your Snapchats, put it on your Instagrams. You know, spread the live, you know. Caribbean Cricket Podcast, you know how we do. So the bowling. Uh, let's go back to the England tour first. Um, actually, let's deal with this point first from D. Samuel. D. Samuel says, Mash, I know you hate 200 plus scores, but 200 is now par to win matches against top sides. Anything below that at the World Cup, West Indies will struggle to defend it. I'm going to get to that point. I think you're. I think there's some valid arguments in there. I wonder, though, uh, D. Samuel, if the West Indian pitches, I know for a World Cup, the ICC has significant say, apart from when it's in India, um, the ICC has significant say over the types of pitches that are mandated at an international tournament, right? I just wonder, in West Indian conditions, if scores over 200 are going to be common. But we, we'll see. Ultimately, we'll see. Um, I, I, I suspect that we won't see as many 200-plus games um, in the Caribbean. <coughs> but anyways, as we're saying, the bowling. So when we played, let's go back to England first. When we played England in those um, five uh, T20 internationals uh, at the back in December, the back end of 2023, um, I'll just read you some stats and facts. Alzari Joseph, three matches, six wickets. At 24 apiece, economy 12.43. Andre Russell, five matches, seven wickets at 28 apiece, economy 10.46. Jason Holder, five matches, six, six wickets at 34, economy 10.30. Romario Shepard only played one match in that England. Ooh, oh, oh, my God, what have I done there? Sorry, people. Um, Jason, uh, Romario Shepard only played one match um, in that series um, against England, right? So three of our five bowlers, the other two bowlers were Akil Hussain and um, Gudakesh Moti. Three of our five bowlers in the England series went at economies at 10 and above. One of them, Alzari, going at 12 and above. My argument basically is this. We are going in, until today's game, when Roston Chase came in, our strategy in the five games versus, five games versus England and the first two games versus Australia. So that's seven of our last eight games. We have gone in with a strategy of only having five bowlers, which means that all five, unless we bowl a team out, have to bowl four overs, right? In the in the in the um in the, in the context of the twenty over game, right? My my thing is this: we don't have five good enough bowlers to go into any T20 match in the cut and thrust of a World Cup, assuming that all five or even three are going to have a good day. I think it's almost a given that when we go in, when, when we go in with that five bowler strategy, I think you have to accept that at least two of those bowlers are going to have a rancid day with the ball. Is that a sound enough strategy for the West Indies knowing that effectively our bowling attack looks bits and pieces. Let's be real about this. It looks a bit bits and pieces out there, right? Let's not forget that against England, let me go to one of my other talking points to remind people, right? The two matches we lost against England, one of those matches, England put up 267 for free. That was probably the one where Phil Salt went ballistic, right? 
In another match, the, the, the so the third the third T20, I think they put up 267 for free. And in the fourth one, it might be the other way around, they chased 225 in 20 overs. In this one against Australia, Australia put up 240 plus in one of the games. And they put up, what was the other one? They put up 240 plus, And they put up in that first one, they put up 213. So four of our last, at least half, of our last eight of the eight T20s we've played, the opposition have put up significant scores over 200. That tells me that our five bowler strategy is significantly flawed. Yes, it's flawed. We don't have the we don't have the assurance that going in with five bowlers can reap rewards for this particular side. Let me just go to the comments and see what people are saying about that. Let, let, let's see. Let's see first and foremost how people deal with that particular analysis. But actually, before I come into the comments, I didn't even tell you about Australia. So in this Australia series, let me read some figures for you. Andre Russell, three wickets at 37 apiece, economy 12.44. Jason Holder, three wickets at 43 apiece, economy 11.63. Right? So from the England series where Holder and Russell both went at an economy over 10 to now the Australia series where Russell's got an economy of 12, Holder's got an economy of 11. That's, that's two of what supposedly are integral members of our five-man attack who you, on any given day, you're like, well, boy, they could be going for licks today. This is before we count Romario Shepherd, who may or may not go for licks, and Alzari Joseph, who may or may not go for licks. It is not. It is not a sound strategy. When you today against today in the third T twenty, we brought Roston Chase in, which meant Roston Chase gave us the flexibility to have. Some of you will disagree, but I think in this format of cricket, Roston is probably frontline bowler. I use that term loosely, but in this format of cricket for the West Indies, he's not a part-time bowler. He's somebody you can legitimately turn to and say, you know what, let's try try bowl us two or three and go for and go for a little bit because someone is going for licks. It's not Rothman Powell. It's not it's not um Sherfane Rutherford where we're just rolling the dice and praying. I think if you give the ball to Roston, you can legitimately expect that Roston might be able to show some level of, of control. What did the Australians call him again? Roston. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Obviously, Roston chase is inevitable. Um, but people need to think realistically. Forget what your personal feelings are about Chasem, whether you think he deserves to be in a West Indies team all the time and so on and so forth. Give me a better sixth bowling option than Chase. The only other option you could suggest to me is Mayers. He's lost his place in the side and he don't take wickets. So give me a better sixth bowling potential option than Ross Ton Chase. Give me a better option. But here's the catch now. Here's the catch. I mean, let me go back into my talking points. Where's my talking points here? Um, the balance of the side. If Ross Ton Chase comes into the side, who comes out of the side? Go in the, let me look in the comments now, people. 200 of you in the live right now. Answer that question for me. If Ross Ton Chase comes in the side, who comes out of the side to balance it up? It has to be, it's got to be a batter for a start. So is it Hope? It's not Puran. It's not Rodman Powell. Surely it's not Shafane Rutherford. So, so it's Hope, is it not? It's not an opener because they're not going to, they're not going to at this juncture, you would think, drop an opener and rejig the order to allow Ross Ton Chase to come in the side. So surely it's Hope then. Hope's the only player in that top six where if you're trying to give yourself a better balance to the side and give yourself a sixth bowling option who can actually do something, it has to be Hope, does it not? Some people are saying Mayers, but Mayers isn't even in the side. 
Mayers, Mayers isn't Mayers isn't in the side right now. So it can't be Mayers. It's, it's got to be Hulk. So, boy, that's... The, sorry, let me clarify. That's if you think Chase deserves to be in the side. And this is the thing, people. I'm not saying Chase should be in the side based on recency bias because he played well today. That's not what I'm saying. This is why I love saying to people, go look at the receipts. Everybody after this episode, you're probably tired, depending, depending on where you're listening to. If you're in England, you're tired after this episode. If you're in the Caribbean, go find the receipts. Before the England series, I did a video saying who should play in the England series. And I said before that T20 series, Chase makes my side because of the balance, because he balances the side out better. Chase didn't play one game in that England series and we won 3-2. And I think that duped a lot of people into thinking we don't need a sixth bowler. I'm telling you lot right now, we need a sixth bowler in this side. I'm not going into the World Cup thinking we can't have a sixth bowler in the side because one of Russell, Holder, Shepard, whoever, is even Alzari is going for licks. At least two of them men will go for licks in every game we play, sometimes free. If you think I'm exaggerating, tell me in the chat right now. If you think I'm exaggerating, tell me. At least two. Minimum two go for licks, sometimes three in any given match. Um, if you think I'm lying, to, if you think I'm exaggerating, please get in the comments right now and tell me I'm exaggerating. Rod says, I don't think Chase is a big tournament player. Can we bank on him? I hear that, you know. I hear the argument. And that's why I'm saying, I'm not saying Chase's name because just because he played well today. I was saying Chase's name from before because I just worry about the consistency of this bowling attack. I just worry about them. Trini says, Trini and MN, MN, where's MN? Minnesota. Um, Shepard is the best death bowling option. Boy, I haven't even got into death bowling yet. We, we, this video is so deep, I ain't even going to get into death bowling today because that's a next problem. That's the next problem that we haven't even thought about. I don't think this Australia series really got me thinking about death bowling and what we're going to do. That's a next conversation. I don't think any of them are good at death bowling, truth be told. I don't, I, I, boy, I wouldn't trust any of our bowlers at the death to defend anything under 15. How about that? People in the comments, put in the comments. Tell me in the comments who, if we had to bowl a tight death over in the World Cup, who are you giving the ball to and how much runs would they need for you to feel safe? For me to feel safe, we need 20. We need 20 minimum to defend. And I'm probably giving it to Alzari to try and defend 20. Anything under 15? Yeah, we've lost that game. I did, don't matter who gets the ball, we've lost that game. Because I, I don't know what you lot are talking about, best death bowling option. There, there's just no option. So, where do I want to go next? Where do I want to go next with this? Um, where do I want to go next? He said, bowlers, the balance of the side. All right, let's go here. Let's go to this point. Good Akesh Multi. Now, we talked about how Chase potentially has to come in as a sixth bowling option, right? Um, and actually, let me go to this point. Kevin Henry says, Roston has to produce with the back if he's going to play. I completely agree, Kevin. And that's the argument about Roston. I don't think Roston has shown enough with the bat consistently enough to warrant playing. But his bowling potentially means we force him into the team. I'm not saying it's a given, Kevin. I'm just saying it's an argument, right? Anyway, it's good to catch Moti. Now, people may have forgotten that in this series, good to catch Moti did not play. I received a message today after the match was over that actually good to catch was ill. Um, of course, Cricket West Indies, if this is true, of course, Cricket West Indies did not communicate this information to anybody. So who knows if it's actually true? But the person who told me this information, I have no reason to doubt what they're saying, that Goodakesh was actually under the weather. And that's why he didn't play any games. He may well have caught licks in Australia anyways, because the, the pitches weren't exactly suited to, to spin bowling, right? Um, <clears throat> but in a in a... In a West Indian or Home World Cup, Gudakesh Multi is a 1,000% lock to play. 
both I expect both him and Akil Hussein to play or start the World Cup. So the next question people have to ask themselves is this. Get ready to put in the comments, people. If we accept that Akil Hussain and Gudakesh Moti are both going to play, someone out of Holder, Dre Russ, and Romario Shepard has to hold a drop. Who, who you lot drop him? Who you lot drop him, please? If Moti is playing, and I think he's a definite lock, along with Akil Hussain, in a home World Cup in West Indian conditions, who holds the drop? Because Holder, Shepard, and, and Dre can't all play. Someone has to hold that drop. So forget Chase for a minute. If Chase comes in, that's for a batter. If Multi comes in, that's for a bowler. Who's Multi coming in for, people? Who's he coming in for? Be boy, everyone's saying Holder. <laughs> Jason and Holder ain't done nothing for Santoki, you know? Everyone's saying Holder out here. Boy, Holder. In the Discord group um, earlier today, there was a big conversation going on about if Jason Holder is... Um, if Jason Holder is world class, but based on what you lot are saying, you're all saying drop Holder. Boy, sticky out here. No wonder Holder went to Rajasthan Royals to do some World Cup or to get ready for the World Cup. But he ain't got no IPL deal, so what's he gonna do? Boy, everyone's saying Holder, you know. Every single a couple. One man said Romario. Kevin Henry says Romario gets the drop. Everybody else is saying, hold on, no one's saying Dre. Now, the reason why I think no one's saying Dre is I think my theory is that everyone accepts that Dre can be expensive with the ball. But I suspect that people would say that you can rely on Dre more to get a wicket. He may be hella expensive, but he might get a wicket. And most importantly of all, if it comes down to Romario, Holder or Dre with the bat, you're taking Dre every single time to try and produce some kind of miracle feat with the bat, which might win you a game. So Dre, Dre trumps Holder and Shepard with the bat. With the ball, I think Shepard currently trumps Holder and Dre with the ball. So then you have to ask yourself, who's better with the ball, Holder or, or Dre? Or does Dre's X factor with the bat means you'll take the risk on what he may or may not do with the ball? Over Holder. It's Holder or Dre for me. It's Holder or Dre. We can't take we can't take the recency bias of Dre hitting 71 of 29 today to just go, well, of course it's got to be Dre. All I know is Dre will be in the IPL prior to the World Cup. What's what what's Holder playing prior to the World Cup? Does that and does it even matter? Does it matter that certain man will be at the IPL honing their skills before the World Cup? Or what's every other man doing? The the, the non-IPL man, what are they doing prior to the World Cup, please? Does anyone know? I know we've got some red ball cricket going on, but that's not going on throughout the whole of the world, throughout the whole of um IPL. So, so what are they going to do? Hmm. Brian says Holder's not in the IPL for a reason. Uh, boy, I don't know, people. Anyways, it's something to consider, okay? Is something definitely to consider. Frank says, ooh, Frank says IPL will do nothing to help West Indies. So will it help other teams then? So Frank, are we saying that IPL helps no teams? What, what we listen, Frank, listen, I'm I'm no fan of these bat up and catch giggle leagues, right? But surely you have to accept that playing in the premier, I playing in the premier T20 tournament is better preparation than sitting in your yard in whichever nation you live in in the Caribbean. Surely we at least have to accept that, right? It's not like it's not like we have significant numbers of international T20 games prior to the World Cup. So I think in, in this year of all years, yes, it may actually matter that people are playing in the IPL as preparation before the World Cup and certainly in the context of coming into the World Cup with some kind of form. Surely we have to accept that. So Frank then says West Indies players have different roles in IPL versus internationals. Do they, though? Is Dre Russ's role in the IPL not similar to his role for West Indies? Is Nicholas Puran's role in the IPL not similar enough to what you'd expect him to do for the West Indies? I think he's a bit of, I think, 
I don't know. I think I think we're being. A, I'm no IPL fan. I think you're being a bit harsh here. I think you're being a bit harsh on IPL. Yeah, it's down bad for Betty Man and all of the corruption and all of that. But come on, man, come on. Um, so, anyway, so that that that, that that's multi. Um, let's move to the next argument. Um, let's move to the next argument now. Ah, this one's going to upset some people. Okay, so. As much as we've beaten South Africa, India, England, and then obviously just lost 2-1 to Australia, has anyone considered that we haven't actually played their full-strength sides? Has, has, has anyone taken time to consider that? Like, India put out... Like, has, like I wonder if anyone's actually noticed this. England were missing three or four men. India were missing at least three men. Australia were missing three or four men. I can't remember the South Africa series anymore, right? But has anybody taken time to to maybe not get into the hype that much? We've been playing our full strength side. Don't get it twisted. We've been playing what we think our best side is based on availability to us. The only person out of the side right now that you would say based on form and their normal ability you'd put into the West Indies side is Hetty. If he took his life serious, Evan Lewis, if he ever cared about playing for West Indies again, maybe Obed McCoy, if he was proper, proper on his game. But we're talking about whereas the other sides just aren't playing their best players. When I say Hetty, Evan Lewis, and Obed McCoy, I'm talking about people who, if they ever found form again, we're not choosing to leave their man out. We can't pick them because they've got zero form. The Australians and the English and the Indians left man out on purpose. So I just want everyone to just call, just a tiny piece, just call a little tiny piece and understand that we've been at full strength and the other sides haven't been at full strength. Right? That doesn't mean we won't do well in the World Cup, but I think you lot might just need to call down a little piece piece and understand that when it's the cut and thrust of the World Cup, and then man come with their full strength sides, things might look a little bit different. So just be a bit careful, people. Be a bit careful to, to get excited out here, you know? And uh, again, I, I said in the Discord group today, I said in the Discord group today, some of you men are taking for granted like we're, like we're coming out of our group. Some of you men are taking it for granted. <laughs> See me. Never, never me. Never me could I be confident enough to say the West Indies will qualify out of their group. I saw what happened in the 2020 World Cup, T20 World Cup, 2021. I saw what happened in 2022. I saw what happened in the OGI World Cup qualifiers. I could never, never again will I take any kind of World Cup performance for granted. These men will have to play out of their skin to come out of the group with New Zealand and Afghanistan. Don't just assume because we won some bilaterals versus England and India and played okay against Australia, that that means we're going to just swap New Zealand aside and swap Afghanistan aside. I, I hope you lot are just tempering expectations ever so slightly. And before anyone says to me, ah, oh, but, 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 who thought Netherlands would chase down 3-7-4? Who thought that? Who thought in the 2022 T20 World Cup that we would lose to Ireland and Scotland and not even make it through to the main stage? Who thought in the 2021 T20 World Cup that we'd lose to everyone except Bangladesh? Never me, you know. Never me could I be coming into this T20 World Cup with full confidence when I've already just explained to you, man, there's issues with our five-man bowling attack. There's issues with the balance of the side. We don't have a sick bowler. There's there's an issue around who does good Akesh Multi come in for, which which of the batting bowling all rounders do we drop? And then there's this issue, and even come to this issue next. Then there's the issue with the openers. Who's our openers for the World Cup, people? Brandon King is a lock, right? Brandon King is a definite lock. Who's opening with Brandon King at the World Cup? 
Is it is, is it Johnson Charles or is it Kyle Mayers? And no matter which one you pick, are you saying that you believe that that opening partnership? How many? So, so we play. We play. Who's in our group again? Uganda, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, and Afghanistan. Out of those four games, how many times do you think our opening partnership will give us a good platform? Who's our openers, people? Who are our openers, people? I'm waiting. Everyone's saying Johnson, Charles, and King. Okay, and I'm not saying I'm not here to. I'm not here to say, well, boy, I agree or I disagree. I just want you all to let that marinate in your head. Our openers for the World Cup is Brandon King and one of Charles and Mayers. That's what it looks like. Unless Sammy and the backroom staff decide at the last minute, you know what? Drop Charles, drop Mayers and rejig the order. Unless they decide to do that at the last minute, to fit people in so that there is a way that you can fit Roston Chase in, by the way, you can fit Roston Chase in if you rejig your order and force somebody down the order to come and open. I'm not saying this is what they should do, but they could easily say, for example, you know what, Nicholas Puran, come and open and treat, treat opening in T20 like you're opening in T10. Or Shafane Rutherford, come and open and treat opening in T20 like you're opening in T10. Because right about now, does it really matter who's opening alongside King? And, and the thing is, I'm talking about Brandon as if Brandon is some big, big bats who is undroppable. But of the three of them, King is the only one that you could say even remotely. You'd say, yeah, you're a lock. Slightly, when you look at it, you have to think, boy, we might be down bad a bit. We might be down bad a bit. But right now it looks like it's King and Charles. But then people have to way up if you think that is a strong unit. So our, our, our batting lineup at this moment in time, our team at this moment in time, looks like King, Charles, Puran, Powell, King, Charles, Puran, pa no, sorry. At the moment, it looks like King, Charles, Puran, Hope, Powell, Rutherford, Dre, Shepherd, Akil, Joseph, Moti. Notice I've left Holder out. That's what our team looks like at this moment in time. For some of you, you lot, some of you put in the chat that that team's going to win the World Cup. Cool then, isn't it? Cool. I hope they do. Rally around the West Indies at all times. But I guess what I'm fundamentally saying is, <clears throat> sorry. Started the, I started the live by saying round of applause. Well done to the team. You've come back to the Caribbean or you're coming back to the Caribbean with two wins out of eight matches, which is more than people probably would have expected. The test win is one for the ages. The T20 series was, we'll take that in Australian conditions. Only our, Remember, only our, only our second ever T20 win in Australia. So we have to take that. The ODI obviously, the ODIs obviously stank, right? So... I guess if we had to if we had to rate it out of 10 in terms of where the side is at right now I'd say I'd say we're a six and a half out of ten I'd say we're a six and a half out of ten at this particular stage heading into the World Cup because I, I still think I still think there is a balance issue. Without, I think fundamentally, there is still a major balance issue without the sixth bowler, and there is an all rounder issue to sort out with regards to bringing back Gudakesh Multi and who has to take a drop. And actually, I've just realized that some of you in the chat have mentioned McCoy. So, this I didn't write this down as the final talking point, but let this be the final talking point. Who is outside the squad that you would put in as a wild card selection going into the World Cup? Most of you will probably say Shamar Joseph, but obviously he's got the obviously he's got the IPL deal, but there's a massive question. And also, no, he's got the PSL, he's got the he's got the, the Pakistan deal and the IPL deal, right? I will be watching how Shamar if Shamar does well in the Pakistan Super League, 
and gets a few games in IPL and does okay, then I think you have to take him to the World Cup regardless. If he plays in Pakistan Super League and gets a few games in the IPL and gets carted for runs in more than, or in at least half of the games, I think you don't take the risk. Because you have to remember for Shamar as well that because he bowled us to victory versus Australia in um, the test match, people are extrapolating that to mean that he's automatically going to be able to adapt to the cut and thrust and the uh, the minutiae and intricacies of T20 cricket. There's no guarantee to that. I hope he does, but there's no guarantee to that. So if I see Shamar go for licks in 50% of the games he plays between Pakistan Super League and IPL, I am not taking the risk of taking him to the World Cup. Is Obed McCoy in the IPL? Down bad T20 giggle men who, who are in this live. Does anyone know if Obed McCoy is in the IPL? I don't know. I don't follow it closely enough to know. Is he in the IPL, anyone? Yes or no? And who's he playing for? Anyone know about Obed McCoy? Is he in IPL this year? I feel like he's probably in the Royals franchise or something. I feel like they I feel like they bought him into slavery, did they not? Um, no, he's not. Okay, so Obed's not in the IPL. So um Obed is another wild card. We don't have a left arm pacer. I think every good T20 side needs that variety. Um, I don't know how they assess if Obed is anywhere near to, to, to being ready to come back into the international side. But, oh, he has a PSL deal. Frank says that Obed has a PSL deal. So maybe I better go watch um, the Hit and Giggle PSL deal, PSL uh, league to see where Obed's at. Those of you who watched Obed in South Africa, anyone who watched the SA20, was he good or was he average? What was Obed saying in South Africa, people? Whoever watched the, the, the down bad SA20? What, what was Obed saying there? Someone getting someone in the comments, let me know. Was he any good? Good, bad, average? What were we saying? Jake Glasgow says Obed did well in SA20. Okay. So, <coughs> so there's an argument um, there's an argument to say that that Obed is a wild card that you bring back in because it's left arm variety. People are talking about um, people are talking about who can bowl at the death. Well, when he's fit and he's playing well, Obed is probably actually one of our best death bowlers in terms of his ability to bowl, bowl change up slower balls. Um, his variety of deliveries means that I'd, I'd prefer a fit and firing Obed before I prefer anybody in our current squad um, to bowl at the death. Um, but I just don't know if there's enough time left for Obed to get up to the form that he's got. And then the last wild card, so I've said Shamar Joseph is a possible wild card. Obed McCoy is a possible wild card. The last possible wild card is Hetty. How about this, people? Listen to what I'm about to suggest. Listen to what I'm about to suggest. Can't believe I'm about to suggest this. Hear me out. Hear me out. If Sammy and his backroom staff believe that Hetty has found form again, because I think he's playing in which are, I think he's playing in the, the Dubai Down Bad League. Hear me out, people. I can't believe I'm about to say it. Bring Hetty back. And make him open. Bring Hetty back and make him open. Jerry says, I'm down bad. I am, Jerry. I accept I'm down bad. But. Okay, let me stop. Let me stop. <laughs> <coughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, people. Sometimes you have to think outside the box. So I'm just saying, sometimes you have to think outside the box. Hetty obviously don't care about his weight, don't care about his conditioning, but Johnson Charles don't care about his weight either. Hold on a minute. Hold on. No, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm done with Hetty like everybody else, but come on. Johnson Charles is big and fat as a big and fat as he's, Johnson Charles' tummy is as big as mine. My tummy's smaller than Hetty's, but Johnson Charles' tummy is as big as mine. So, 
we can't just be talking about Big Belly Hetty and not looking at and at not looking at Johnson Charles as well. You know what? Bun you lot. Bring Hetty back and tell him to open. There, I said it. You know what? I don't care what anyone says. Bring Hetty back and tell him to open. Cutting edge says Johnson Charles is muscle. No man, I've seen that belly. You know, don't let me don't let me bust out my belly on the screen and and show you lot the. No, come on, man. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You man, listen. <laughs> I just listen. <laughs> listen. I'm just saying that we need to think about the. I, I, I'm just saying that there there could be some left field options we could consider. Okay, if I if I said okay, you know what? Okay, bun the Hetty option. Everyone's everyone's slandering me, saying I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, take away the Hetty option. Would you let Rutherford open instead of Charles? I just wonder if I just wonder if there is if we're we're too locked into this notion that it has to be um that it has to be King and then Charles or Mayers when there's potentially left field options that we could work with who may give us far more consistency at the top of the order than what we're like we're we're telling ourselves it has to be Charles or Mayers but does it have to be I'm just talking about people who are outside the squad who you could think about bringing in to tweak things around. The obvious answer, of course, is Evan Lewis. But obviously, I don't know what's going on. Desi and Evan Lewis don't seem to talk. Uh, what, is Evan Lewis... Was Evan Lewis... Who, who watches... Who watched the Down Bad Bangladesh League? I think Evan was in that one. Does anyone know if he played all right in that? Who watched Down Bad Bangladesh? Um, the BPO is, is is that even going on still? Has anyone seen where is Evan Lewis? I swear he's in Down Bad Bangladesh League. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if 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 it was me and if I was in charge, I would have break I would have broken bread with Evan Lewis a long time ago and brought him back into the fold. Um, but you know it it is what it is. Um, wait wait what? Now what's this now? Who's Sinclair? Which, which, what Sinclair are you talking about? What, Frank Sinclair, former Chelsea centre-back? Former reggae boy Frank Sinclair? That that could be the only Sinclair you're talking about. Which Sinclair are you on about? Nah, it could never be the Sinclair I think you're talking about. Impossible. Um, right, listen, people. Um, what are we saying? 47 minutes have gone in the live. Um... Let me lock this one off. 275 people in the live. Um, 275 people in the live. I think I've covered all the points, though, you know. Oh, we didn't do player ratings. Sorry, let's just end with... Let's do. Let's end with player ratings. Um, so let's go through the team. So let me give you the stats, people, and then we'll just end there. Where are we? Uh, right, so the Australia T20 series. So first things first, openers. Brandon King, two matches. Top score of 53. Um, he scored a 53 and he scored a 5. Average of 29. Strike rate 126. Uh, what are we saying for Brandon King? Six and a half? No, he got a 50. Seven. Seven, six and a half, seven. Six and a half, seven, I think, for Brandon King. He got a 50. It's not like... How many 50s? There were only four 50s in the series by West Indians. So <coughs> it seems harsh to give him anything lower than six. Um, maybe six and a half for Brandon King. Um, Johnson Charles, he played all three matches. High score of 42. Um, 70 runs in total. An average of 23. Strike rate 166. So you could say he did his job strike rate wise, top score of 42. What are you saying for Johnson Charles people? Five? Five? Five for Johnson Charles? Five, yeah, lots of you in the comments saying five for Johnson Charles. Um, Carl Mayers came in as an opener for today's game, 11 runs, strike rate 157. Carl Mayers people? Mayers, Mayers is on the verge of a drop, you know. He'll probably still go to the World Cup because he's the backup opener. But he's in, he's in some kind of funk out here. Uh, Carl Mayers, most of you saying one. 
one, two, one, one, two, three. Yeah, I don't think three. I don't think you can give three. Um, he only got one chance. He didn't bowl. Yeah, one. One for Carl Mayers, you know, one. Uh, number three. Who was three in this tournament? P or, was it Tr Puran? Puran, 37 runs, top score of 18, and average of 12, strike rate 123. Um, one? One for Puran? Has to be one. One for Puran. He's, he's lucky that I'm not saying zero. I think it's got to be one for Puran. Yeah, one for Puran. Most of you saying one, two, minus one. Yeah, if, if, if I'm giving Mayers two or one, then Puran also has to get one, maybe 1. 1.5. Um, Shea Hope, two matches, 16 runs. He got a 16 and a duck. 16 and a duck for Shea Hope. One? One for Shea Hope? Boy, I don't want to give that ones out here. One for Shea Hope? So what we said so far, so I said, uh, King, I said 6.5. Charles, I said 5 or 4.5. I can't remember what I said. Puran, I said 1. Mayers, I said 1. Hope, I'm saying 1. Um, boy, enough man saying 0. <coughs> allow me, please, please allow me. Enough of you saying none for, none for Hope. Uh, what did Hope do in that England series? Let me just go find that. In the England series, Hope scored... He played all five matches and scored 122 runs at 30. Strike rate 118 with a top score of 43 not out. Hey, Hope's place is in jeopardy, you know. Hope's place is in jeopardy. I know they see him as that kind of middle order Marlon Samuels role in T20s to stabilize and stuff and then accelerate. But his place might be in jeopardy. But then when you consider that his place might be in jeopardy for Roston Chase, maybe his place isn't in jeopardy. Um, anyways, one for hope. Who's number five? Rothman Powell. Um, Rothman Powell, three, he played all three matches, 98 runs at 33, top score of 63, uh, strike rate 178. Yeah, that's strong. Seven. Seven for Powell? I think it's seven for Powell. Ra, you lot are saying five for Powell. Hold on, let me look at that again. 98 runs at 33 apiece. Top score of 63. One of only four batters to get a 50. Strike rate of 178. This could be a seven, surely. Because of the, <coughs> because of the strike rate, a 178 strike rate, there was, Powell had to do quite a lot of rebuilding in, in, in this series. Um and try and accelerate at the same time. I think seven for power. I think seven for power, to be fair. Um, who's after power? Rutherford. Rutherford. 74 runs at 37 apiece. Top score of 67, which was today of 40 balls, which means that his other two innings, he only scored seven runs in total across the other two innings. The 67 of 40 was good today because at one point he was 21 of 21. Um, but then his other two innings was a failure. Six and a half for Rutherford? Six and a half because the 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 the, the one innings he played today actually helped us win the match. So you kind of have to at least give him a minimum of a six. It was it was a match winning knock, along with obviously Dre Russ's knock. So yeah, and his strike rate was 161. I think six and a half for Rutherford, maybe six, because the other two innings were failures. Um, who's after Rutherford? Oh, Chase came in today. So Chase won match today, 37 runs um, from 20 balls with the bat. And, of course, he, he took two wickets for 19 with the ball today in his uh, four-over spell. He only played the one match. It's got to be nine for Chase, based off his one match that he played today. What are we saying for Chase, people? Nine? Chase, five? What? KD said five? What? What are you talking about, bro? Ch Chase was... <laughs> Come on, man. Chase, Chase effectively was the glue that 
choked the Australian innings today with the ball. It's got to be, it's got to be, in terms of just a one-off match, I think it's got to be nine for Chase based on his contribution today, right? I'm going nine. Some of you are saying eight, 8.5, whatever. Uh, Jerry says 7.5. Some people are saying five for Chase. If Chase is five, then the rest of them are zero um, on, on that basis. I'm giving him nine. Uh, Andre Russell, three matches, 109 runs at 36 apiece. Highest strike rate in the team, a strike rate of 231. In fact, 232 across the three matches. Highest score of 71, 71 of 29 balls um, today. Um, and then with the ball, with the ball, Dre took three wickets at 37 with the highest economy in the team of 12.44. Uh, he only And those three wickets he took only came in one match. Um, where he took three for 42 across his four overs. I don't know what we say about Dre because the bowling, the bowling is erratic. Um, the batting was magnificent today and he rightly, he rightly won man of the match for his knock today. But the problem with Dre and the bowling at the moment is you're pretty much guaranteed that one in every three matches, some might even say one in every two, Dre is actually going to go for a lot of runs. I, it's almost like it's almost like there's no in between for Dre. Either he takes wickets and plays a significant role with the ball, or he gets or he goes for loads of runs. Um, it's a it's a it's a really fine balance to understand. Like Dre to me plays no matter what. I would never drop Dre based on the in in the kind of pecking order with him, Shepard and Holder, but we have to acknowledge that his bowling can be match losing at times, but it can also obviously be match winning. Um, let's give Dre 7.5. Um, I think Dre is 7.5 for me. It's a good point here from Ash. Ash says, I think Dre is a sixth bowler who should get a couple of overs. That's, yeah, I see your point. In a properly balanced side, you're not asking Dre to bowl all four. I think you're saying to Dre, I'm going to give you two. And if it's going well, I might ask you to bowl four. If it's not, you're not, you weren't supposed to bowl four in the first place. But if Dre doesn't bowl four, there's an argument to say, what is he in the side to do? What's he in the side for in the first place? Right. And this goes back to one of my earlier points about is the balance of the side right? And then Neeks follows that up with my point then which is why I think you have to try and force Chase into the side. Because if you know that Chase can supplement somebody else's overs where they're not bowling well, then you're not worried about Dre having to fulfill his four or Holder having to fulfill his four or whatever it might be. Um, so anyways, definite, definite question marks um, to think about going forward with Dre. But for now, I'm giving Dre a 7.5. Um, who's left in the team after Dre? I think we've done all the batters. Holder. So Holder with the bat. Holder was actually all right with the bat, you know. 62. In fact, Holder didn't get out at all. He got a 34. No one dismissed Holder. He batted twice. He got a 34 not out and a 28 not out. Um, went at a strike rate of 200. And then with the ball, he took three wickets at 43 apiece with an economy of 11.63. So overall with the ball, Holder was dreadful in terms of what you'd want from him. But with the bat, he played some timely knocks at the back end. For what I just said with Dre, you could also make a similar argument about Holder. The difference is you definitely expect Holder. If Holder's in the team, he has to bowl four overs. Is Holder's bowling good enough for him to bowl four overs at the moment? Let me go back to that England series, see how Holder did with the ball. In that England series, Holder took six wickets at 34 across the five matches and went an economy of 10.3. Difficult questions. There's some difficult questions that need to be asked about Jason Holder. Some very difficult questions. There is no way that Jason Holder can be a guaranteed lock in this side. But anyways, based on the series with the bat, I thought it was positive. Um, and that, that's bollocks makes a good point. The batting's irrelevant. He's not in the team to bat. Their bonus runs. I hear you. I don't know if in T20 you call anybody's runs at number eight or nine bonus runs. I think you expect them to be able to bat. 
but I think you're right to say that the what he does with the ball is what should take precedence of what he does with the bat. In that context, the, and Trini and MN says that Holder is a bowling all-rounder, in that context, if that's the way you're viewing it, then his rating has to be low then. His rating has to be low. He took three wickets of 43 apiece, economy 11.30. So, that, so if you're saying that the batting doesn't counterbalance that, he's on a four. If the batting does counterbalance it, then he's on 5.5. So what, what are we saying, people? What's Holder's rating? It's either four or 5.5 for me. But I'll see what you lot say in the comments. <coughs> Rough Cut says, what was the economy of the opposition bowlers? That's a good point, actually. Let me just get that for you. Um, so. The Australian bowlers were uh, Stoinis, five wickets at 11, economy eight. Um, Hazelwood, two wickets at 37, economy 9.37. Um, Bartlett played today, two wickets at 37, economy 9.25. The Australians basically bowled a lot more people. Um Zampa went at 10.83, took five wickets at 26. Uh, Johnson, oh yeah, the Australian, listen, the Australians bowled bare people, you know. The Australians were experimenting out here. And this goes, again, this goes back to one of my earlier points about they weren't even playing their full strength side. They were just, they were handing out debuts to bare next man. Um, anyways, J. Luke makes a point. I think that's a valid point. J, J. Luke says Jason's bowling will be more effective in the Caribbean with his slow ball and cutters. Yeah, I think there's I think there's an argument in that. I think there's a I think there's a clear argument in that for sure. Anyways, let's move on. So that's Jason. And um let's just quickly finish this off and then I'll lock off the live. I think we're reaching the hour mark, so we should lock it off. We've just gone past the hour mark. Um Romario Shepherd, he scored 16 runs in his three at bats. He only faced 17 balls, to be fair. With the ball, he took four wickets at 29, economy 9.75. Um, Shepard's in the team to bowl. His, his quota of four overs. He went in the economy of 9.75. I'll give him a six for that. I'll give him a six. Wait, Jamandi says zero for Shepard. Hold on. But based on the and based on the analogy that everybody else gave about what they in the team to do, Shep, Shepard's in the team to bowl, isn't he not? That's the first thing we need to consider. And he out everybody else in the team. So, yeah, let me just check. Yeah, based on economy, apart from Roston today, Shepard out bowled everybody else in the side, got more wickets at a, at a slightly better, on av at a better economy. So Shepard has to be on a 6, 6.5, irrespective of what he did with the bat. Um, maybe you could even argue it's a 7. You could even go as far as saying that. Okay. Alzari Joseph. He actually did have a slightly better economy than um, Romario Shepard, but he, he went in the economy of 9.58. But Alzari took less wickets, three wickets at 38 apiece. So Alzari... And Alzari bowled his full quota. So I would say, what, Alzari's a six then? Alzari's a six. Shepard out bowled Alzari for me. So Alzari is a six. Um, do you know what? I didn't even talk about who should be in the new ball. But that's, again, we ain't got time for that today. So that's another conversation for another day. Um, so Alzari, I think, is a six. And then lastly, Akil Hussain. I think he's the only person I haven't mentioned. Um, one wicket. Economy 10.70. Um, nothing to write home about with the bat. Akil, one wicket. Economy 10.70. I think before I give Akil's rating, what everyone needs to ask themselves is what is Akil's role in the what was Akil's role in the side in these conditions? Was it to be wicket to wicket and just try and keep it tight? Was it to be a wicket taker? And the reason why I ask that is because Australia didn't bowl they Australia bowled Zampa, who's a leg spinner, um, and a premier leg spinner in the context of Australian conditions. They didn't bowl another spinner. So I I kind of felt like conditions were against Akil in the sense of asking Akil to be a wicket taker. Um, but that said, he still only took one wicket 
and economy of 10.7. So two, two. And I'm only saying two in the context of I don't think it was the right conditions to be judging the kill, um, judging the kills game. And actually, it's a good point from Crick Lover. Kill's economy was on a par with Zampa. Just Zampa just took more wickets, which is fair, to be honest. I think that's a fair point to make. To make room. Rod says Akil is there to bowl and control the runs. So it all depends on if you think an economy of 10.7 from a spinner in unhelpful conditions was acceptable in the context of controlling runs. I don't know. Let's say two or three for now, though. Although I think that might be a bit harsh in the context of what we're talking about. Um, Westfield says we should have played multi. Westfield, I can only assume you joined in late. Uh, my understanding is that multi was ill, which is why he did not play any of the games. He caught some kind of cold, flu, whatever, and was under the weather. So they didn't select him because of that. So it wasn't a case of Akil was selected over Multi. I think Multi just wasn't well enough to play in those games. That's what's been, that's the information that has been disseminated to me. But um, I, like West Indies cricket, West Indies never confirmed that. So who knows if that's the story or not. This West Indies cricket, anything could be true. Anything could not be true. Who knows with West Indies cricket? Um, Brian says you guys are difficult raters. I agree, Brian, and that's why I'm, I'm in an R in about what I've given a kill there. I do think context has to be um, put in place. But anyways, people, listen, um, I've spoken for a long time here. I thought I was going to end it at 45 minutes and then I remembered to do player rating. So thank you for everyone who's joined the live at whatever point you join the live. If you're watching this on the replay, thank you for watching it on the replay. If you came in late, go back and watch it at the start once I once I, once I I lock this off. Um, remember, uh, on the way out for the video, like the video, share the video, subscribe. Um, subscribe is the main thing. Well, actually, like and subscribe is the main thing. If you want to follow the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, find us on Twitter, Instagram, uh, our website, Facebook. Just type in Caribbean Cricket Podcast into Google and you must find everything um, that we do. And just remember as well that tomorrow, if you're feeling really down bad, the, um, the second round of the four-day championship begins tomorrow around two o'clock Jamaican time, uh, three o'clock, no, sorry, three o'clock Jamaican time, two o'clock uh, Eastern Caribbean time. Jamaican Scorpions are playing uh, CCC. Barbados Pride are playing the Women's Island Volcanoes. Leeward Island Hurricanes are playing Guyana Harpy Eagles and uh, Trinidad and Tobago Red Force are playing the West Indies Academy. All of those matches are live on YouTube. Um, you can watch them there on the West, via the West Indies YouTube page. I think that's open to pretty much everyone. Some of you may need a VPN um, to, to watch that. But yeah, some, so you'll see myself or and some of the others in this live chat, probably in the live chat for some of those games. I tend to flip between whichever one I'm fancying to watch at any particular moment in time. I think I'll start with Jamaica versus CCC because that's probably going to be the most down bad game. And then um, I'll go from there. But listen, as ever, people, thank you for joining the live. Um, yeah, you know, and thank you in general for supporting the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Um, it's been another long one, you know. But um, my voice is going. So let me lock this one off. Um, look out for more content as usual. Oh, sorry, I should just say, sorry. We've got a guest coming on, Miles Bascom, um, the director of Cricket West Indies, um, is um, coming, or director of cricket, I should say, for Cricket West Indies, is coming on the show. We are recording that one on Monday. So if you've got any questions for the director of cricket um, in, in the region, um, please do send your questions in. Usually Twitter's the best place to send those questions in by. Um, could do it via Insta as well. So if you've got any burning questions and issues about the structure of the game in the region, how the game is run, domestic tournaments, uh, youth man development, um, the women's game, etc., so on and so forth, now's the time to put those questions uh, to Miles. So Miles, like I say, he'll be, Santoki will be back by then. We'll record that show. Um, and drop that on Monday um, next week. So to do look out for that. Please get your questions in. Oft, uh, often we get lots of people saying, oh, but why haven't West Indies cricket done this? Why haven't they done that? And I, I went to Miles and I said, listen, Miles, I think you should come on the show, you know, and um, speak to the people, speak to the people who follow um, the Caribbean Cricket Podcast to um, 
kind of, you know, just tell them about what your plans are and what you're trying to do in West Indies cricket, the development plan and so on and so forth. So I think that's a really, that should be a really instructive episode. Um, and as and as ever, we 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 try to put the questions to stakeholders that you lot want answered. So please do send them in. It's a perfect opportunity to get answered whatever it is that you've always wanted answered about um, cricket in the region. So, so yeah, head to Twitter and send those questions in, people. My voice is gone. Brian, I just saw your super chat. Thank you so much um, for the contribution at the last minute, Brian. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Um, listen, people, I'm going to log out now. I've been Mashal St. Patrick here at One Half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. You've been the audience. I've been me. See you soon. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. 